All right, so today we're going to be talking about pressure and barometers. All right, so first up, define what pressure actually is. So pressure is a force uh, divided by an area. Now, uh, of course, um, everyone should know what area is. Of course, that's just you know, length times width. That's no problem. Uh, now, what do we mean by force? Well, there is the uh, physics definition of force, which is that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, so mass, of course, we've talked about what mass is uh, before. And acceleration is the rate and change in velocity. Uh, that is, of course, uh, the rate at which things get faster. Usually when we're going to be dealing with this, uh, this is going to be dealing with the acceleration of gravity um, in this case here. So the acceleration of gravity, at least on Earth, and that's what we're just going to be worrying about in this class here, is uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. So there's a couple of ways that you can actually apply a force. Uh, the easiest way is you simply just put something on top of something else and then the mass of that object will be applying a force and hence over a certain area will be applying a certain pressure to that object. And the one way that we apply a force is you know just by the mass uh, that we have in us or an object and you know the acceleration of gravity on there. Now we can also increase the force. Um, I'm sure all of you have stood on a scale at one point, you know, read your weight and then you know either push down on a neighboring object or pushed up to uh, you know make your weight you know go up or down. You know so that's another way that you can actually change the force on an object and you know it's very easy you know using pistons and whatever to actually um, apply much much higher pressures uh, than you could get, you know, just by the force of, you know, the mass pushing down via gravity. So, for instance, since we're going to mainly be dealing with gases and stuff, and but we can also look at these in terms of water or other masses as well, um, this force over here... Okay, so, I mean, there's a couple of ways, and basically they're all the same because it's essentially just the weight um, of the object. So, um, when we're dealing with gases, um, the pressure that we're going to be dealing with is just due to the weight of the air above and we'll see how uh, that uh, comes about. Um, and actually, it turns out, uh, just by using a barometer, we can actually weigh the entire atmosphere. Um, we'll look here at water. Um, so the weight of the water above, and plus the air above you as well. So if you've ever gone swimming, you know that if you go deeper into the water, you know, the pressure increases uh, quite dramatically. And for water, we'll actually show that it's about uh, 10 meters of water, actually works out to about one atmosphere of pressure. And uh, then finally, you know, just the weight of an object. All right, and we'll actually just um, demonstrate this one uh, right now. So let's say, you know, you're a person and you are wearing two shoes, you know, one on each foot. Okay, so here's just a visual little approximation of your shoes. Now let's just say each side here is four inches by ten inches. All right, and let's just assume you're flat-footed, so, you know, all your weight is being evenly distributed um, on the ground. Now let's assume that uh, you weigh 160 pounds and uh, for this we have this many pounds so that's going to be our force you know the weight pushing down and we're going to divide by the area of course this is going to be the area uh, that uh, the shoe is actually uh, pushing down on so here we have 10 by 4 so that's going to be 40 square inches plus 40 square inches a total of 80 square inches so obviously that's 160 over 80 that's very easy um, that's just going to be 2 pounds per square inch Okay, so if you're a 160 pounds person and you wear shoes about this big and you're standing there, you're exerting on the surface of the ground or if, whoever you're standing on, um, two pounds, and this is a two, this is an L right there, that's two pounds per square inch. Now you also may remember, and this is probably more valid for the students who have you know, lived in the States, you've heard of the expression, you know, how many pounds per square inch or PSI. And you may have heard that uh, one atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Well, we're going to be seeing this as one of our conversions a little bit later on, but one atmosphere is the same thing as pounds per square inch, meaning that on every little square inch of surface, so basically about yay big, although that will depend on the size of your screen you're watching on, um, if this is one inch by one inch, so I'll just call this one square inch here, um, there are 14.7 pounds of pre or 14.7 pounds of force pushing down on that one square inch. Um, and that means, you know, really on every square inch of my body surface, there's 14.7 pounds pushing down um, on there. Now, of course, the whole reason I don't get squished is because on the inside of me, I'm also pushing out with uh, about 14.7 pounds. Actually, it's just a tad more. And when we talk about blood pressure, um, we'll see where that actually comes from. So it's this whole equilibrium um, thing that we're actually uh, getting into here. All right, now this was the example with uh, a person wearing, you know, fairly large regular tennis shoes. But now let's say they're wearing, um, you know, high heels, 
and uh, you know you have those you know very narrow pointy parts on the back. I have well, the heels, I guess, of the, the shoe. And let's just say that um, you're standing just on one little shoe heel part, and the uh, width of that is a half of an inch by a half of an inch. So that, of course, means here my area is going to be a quarter square inch. So that's just if I was just standing on one heel of my pointy shoe. So if we do that, well now we're still going to weigh exactly the same amount, but now our area is going to be much smaller. So this means that this pressure here, that's going to be 160 pounds per one quarter, or 0.25 square inches. And of course when you do that, that's just 160 times 4, and that's going to work out to be 640 pounds per square inch. Now of course that's why if you happen to step on somebody with you know regular shoes they say ow um, but you know if you step on somebody with pointy heels like this you could you know seriously injure somebody because you're applying the same amount of force over a much smaller area so the pressure is much much larger and as you can see here this is one atmosphere of pressure uh, this is 640. This is f um, over 40 times larger than atmospheric pressure. Okay, so this is like 40 atmospheres of pressure pushing down um, on this little uh, heel part compared to uh, you know one atmosphere. So um, this is uh, why that actually hurts uh, so much. Now we said here um, this next one: the weight of the water um, above you um, also contributes to uh, pressure, and we can actually go and calculate this. Um, since we know this basic equation here, uh, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we're, we know we can, using our area and also the density, we can actually figure um, out an equation for this. And uh, this is actually kind of a, a valuable equation, at least for substances which have a uniform uh, density. So we said here that the force is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. And I'm just going to use g here to represent um, our acceleration of gravity. So I'm just going to use G because that's what we're going to be talking about in these cases here. Now we also know that mass is going to be equal to my density times my volume, right? Because density is mass per volume, so we just multiply these two out, and we're going to now know that mass is equal to my density times my volume. So we can very easily write here that force is equal to density times volume times gravity. Okay, so we've just substituted in um, the mass right here. So that's all I've done, and I just substituted this part in for the mass. So now it's density times volume over gravity. Now we also know that pressure is equal to the force over the area. And we just defined over here that force is equal to my density volume times gravity. So I'll plug that in over my area. Now if you remember back when we talked about you know areas and volumes and everything and you know do those conversions, we also know that the volume is equal to the area times the height. So in other words, if I have here just like let's say a little box, like so. So this top portion right here will have an area A. So that's my area on the top, and it's going to have some heights, like so. Alright, so that's just my area times my height. That obviously just gives me my volume. So, since we know that volume is equal to area times height, then I can just plug this into here. All right, so I'm just going to take this, plug that in for my volume, and I'm going to get here that my pressure is going to be equal to my density times my area times my height times gravity divided by my area. Obviously, my area cancels out. And uh, we're going to get density times height times gravity. Okay, and this is going to be equal to my pressure. So this um, is a very useful equation if you're dealing with liquids um, which have a nice uniform density. Now if we're dealing with air, um, if we're dealing over small distances we can use this, but if we're going over large distances like saying from sea level up to a mountaintop, we can't do this because the density of the air is going to be a function of the height. And you can technically do it, but you need calculus, and you know we want to try to avoid calculus as much as possible. Um, but if we're dealing with something that has a uniform density over your distance, like water, um, then we can uh, you know very easily use this equation. Uh, we can also see later on when using this equation how to relate a mercury and a water barometer or any other liquid type of barometer, um, and we can also uh, help. Uh, predict uh, what the change in uh, pressure will be as you go up and down a hill. Uh, now the one thing we just have to be very careful here is about the units um, when we're actually dealing with this equation here because if we use the wrong units you know it will not make um, any sense here. 
Okay. So first up, the density is going to be in kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, normally we always give our, our densities in grams per cubic centimeter, but in this case it has to be kilograms per cubic meter to make sure that uh, the units work out. Um, our height is going to be in meters, and g, which is our acceleration of gravity, is 9.8 meters per second squared. So really what we did here is that we just made sure that all of our uh, values, all of our numbers that we put in there are in SI units. All right, we don't want to use any you know, non-SI units because it'll just uh, screw that up. And of course, then what will our pressure be? will wind up to be what's known as something as a Pascal. So this is the SI unit of pressure. Now what is a uh, Pascal? And actually if we just run through these units, uh, we can actually see what uh, those this you know when these cancel out. And it's it's a weird unit, but you know it's just the way um, the math works out here. So if we happen to look at this, we'll have our density. So that's going to be my kilograms per cubic meter times my height, which is just going to be in meters. And then we're going to multiply this by my g, which is just meters per second squared. So once we do that, um, we're going to have meters times meters. That's meters squared divided by meters cubed. So really this is going to work out to be kilograms per meter second squared. And this is equivalent to what's known as a Pascal. Now again, you know, these are a bit of a weird unit. Um, you can also see this as newtons per square meter. That's equivalent as well. Um, we're not going to worry about that, but essentially when you're doing these kind of uh, calculations, as long as you make sure your units are, are or your values are in the correct so whenever you're doing these calculations, as long as you make sure your values are in the correct units, you know, we're happy. So we're going to come back to this um, in a little bit. Um, but first of all, what we want to do is actually describe how a barometer actually works. And then when we describe this, we can actually figure out well, what one atmosphere of pressure is in terms of Pascals. And then use that uh, to help derive uh, some other units here. All right, so we're going to describe right now uh, a barometer. So, and this is going to be the very simple barometer. Uh, later on, we'll describe other types of ways of measuring the pressure, but this, of course, is the initial way that uh, Evangelista Torricelli uh, invented the first barometer and really is the whole basis for um, you know, our pressure measurements um, and everything. All right, so what we're going to have down here is a pool of mercury. This is going to have a tube inserted into it. Right here is just going to be my tube coming up like so. And now, of course, what happens is that you fill this tube up um, with the mercury and then you invert it and then you basically just let the mercury fall down to its natural level. All right, and when this happens it's going to you know, go up to a certain level here and then essentially this entire thing here is just going to be filled um, with mercury. Okay, so everything that's in blue there um, is the mercury. Now up at the top here, this is vacuum. Now it's not actually vacuum vacuum, there would be a couple of little mercury atoms and stuff floating around in there, but it's, it's close enough to vacuum that uh, we're perfectly happy with it. Alright, so that's nearly vacuum, um, and then the mercury goes down, um, you know, and then settles at a certain level. What we measure is the height between the top of the mercury up here, and the level, the bottom level of the mercury over here, okay? So we're not measuring to the bottom of the tube, we're measuring to the top of the mercury on the outside here, okay? And the reason for that is, um, if you think about it, if you go swimming and you're in a pool of filled with water, um, it doesn't matter how deep the water is below you, all that matters is how much water is actually above you, and that's going to determine the pressure. So it's how much is actually um, above you here. So uh, right here, this is the, the height, and then what's actually keeping this mercury suspended is the fact that, you know, on both sides here, we have the atmosphere pushing down, right? So essentially we have the atmosphere pushing down this way, so the atmosphere is pushing up here, and then once it pushes the mercury down, um, that mercury gets squeezed and it gets pushed up into this tube. And then eventually it reaches a certain height where the weight of the mercury which is pushing down is equal to the weight of the atmosphere and the two are in equilibrium. So that's really the important thing of why barometer works is that the weight of the mercury inside this tube is equal to the weight of the atmosphere pushing that mercury up into the tube. All right, so that's why barometers work. All right, and if you had this thing was open to the air, then nothing would happen, right? It's, it simply just wouldn't, uh, nothing would actually happen there. And uh, what they discovered was that, you know, if you did this over and over again, it always consistently went to basically the same height. And over time, um, we've defined, you know, that height to be uh, one atmosphere of pressure. And we call this uh, 760 
millimeters of mercury. So in other words, if you go there and measure from the bottom here to the top, that's going to be 760 millimeters, about three quarters of a meter high, and that is going to be equal to what we now know as one atmosphere, or one ATM. So we've uh, made our little adjust or a little calculation here. So actually, at this point, we can actually figure out well what is the atmospheric pressure in terms of our pascals. Right? So we have our little uh, equation we have up here, the density times the height times gravity is equal to the pressure. Well, we've just figured out, okay, well, this is my height, my 760 millimeters of mercury. My density of my mercury, on the other hand, uh, we can actually figure that out. Um, well, actually, that's, that's a, the density of mercury, something which is easily measured. So the density of mercury is uh, 13.6 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. This is one of those numbers that just pops up a lot that um, you, know, you might just know it by heart after a while. And of course, we want this to be in uh, kilograms per cubic meter, so we just need to do a little conversion here. So it's a good little practice. All right, so again, um, just to refresh our memories, this is going to work out to be uh, negative two cubed, so that's 10 to the minus six. Flip it over, so it's gonna be 10 to the plus six. And then that's gonna be uh, 10 to the, one over 10 to the minus three, so that's 10 to the minus three. So that's gonna be 13.6 times 10 cubed or about 13,600. Um, so then we have everything we need. We have our height, and of course our height, since this is in millimeters, um, that's just gonna be 0 0.76 meters um, is gonna be our height. So we have this value, um, that's gonna be my density right over here. And we know gravity, so we can very easily just calculate this out to figure out well what the pressure in Pascals is going to be. And we get here, and again, we're only gonna basically have uh, well, I've this limited to three sig figs. So this works out to be like 101 times 10 to the third um, pascals. All right, now this is, you know, correct to the correct number of sig figs. Um, later on, we'll actually see when we do all the uh, actual conversions, uh, one atmosphere is actually equal to 101325 pascals. So there's a slight little discrepancy between this one and this one. Uh, basically, it's just that you know the density of mercury I didn't you know carry out to extra sig figs, and the acceleration of gravity could be a little bit different as well. Um, but once you account for all that, you know this is the you know universally accepted value right here. One atmosphere is 101.3 101325 um, pascals, or you could equivalently write this as 1.01325 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Either way, you know is is perfectly acceptable. So, so far we figured out well one, what one atmosphere actually is using our barometer here. And now we can actually go here and actually uh, do a similar thing and figure out, well, how much water does it take to equal one atmosphere of pressure? And uh, we'll just uh, do that little calculation. Now, again, that's just gonna utilize this lovely little equation that we've derived. So the density of uh, water is approximately one gram per cubic centimeter. All right, now of course again we need this in uh, kilograms per cubic meter and actually we already just saw that thing that we just did so I don't need to rewrite it. Essentially we're just gonna you know multiply this entire thing by 10 to the third, right? So plus 6 minus 3 that's 10 to the third. So really that's just going to uh, be over here. So that's just our density of our water, you know basically just doing the exact same thing that we just did right there. Um, so that's the density of water. Um, and then uh, we want to figure out well, what my height is, but we want to basically just use this uh, one atmosphere of pressure. So we just found out that that's uh, 101325 pascals. So again, my pressure is equal to the density times my height times gravity. So this is going to be 101325 pascals. And this is equal to my density, 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, times my height, which I'm trying to figure out, times my 9.8 meters per second squared. And this works out to be, that works out to be 10.3 meters of water. Essentially, if you just remember here that the, uh, for, uh, in water, approximately 10 meters of water is equivalent to one atmosphere. All right, that's, you know, a pretty easy thing to, uh, to actually remember here. And it's kind of uh, good when we just start thinking about um, pumping and uh, you know how high that water can go um, without um, you know any external um, influence. 
And it's actually kind of uh, good to just start thinking about, you know, because mercury in this barometer that we just saw here, you know, is a fluid, water is a fluid. So theoretically, you could build a water barometer. Um, the only problem with this is um, this nice mercury based barometer um, was um, about a meter high, which is, you know, very manageable. Um, the problem here with a water-based barometer is that it's now 10 meters high, or about 33 feet. So that's a couple of stories. So that's not exactly manageable. And a couple other thing is, water has a tendency to freeze when it gets cold, so your barometer would be completely useless in Minnesota, uh, <clears throat> in the winter especially. And the other thing is, of course, uh, mercury has a very low vapor pressure. So this up here is pretty much near vacuum. If you were to fill this up with water, that water would literally start boiling. And uh, we'll see this later when we talk about vapor pressure, but there will be a, a significant amount of water vapor up here that would ruin this vacuum and actually cause uh, quite a significant offset with this. So that's why you, you don't really see you know, water-based uh, barometers um, around. Although you could you know, build one if you wanted to. Um, now also, this is another thing, again, thinking back to this barometer, this was a big conundrum when they started thinking about you know, how high that water can actually go in trees. Because if you're um, a tree, you have to get you know, your water up from the roots all the way up to the top. And there are definitely trees which are higher than 10 meters tall. So the way they do that, of course, is via capillary action. Essentially, if you have a very, very narrow tube, the water molecules can crawl up the sides um, of this. Now, if you have a wide enough tube, that won't work. But you need very narrow tubes, and that's why you can actually get you know, uh, water up to very high. So because you have very narrow tubes in this, of course, your xylem and your phloem and all that, uh, the water can actually get up um, to extreme heights um, in trees. Um, another thing, if you happen to be thinking about uh, designing a water flow system in a building, you know, if you want to get the water from the ground level up to the top of the building, well, if your building is more than 10 stories tall, um, you have a problem here because the natural pressure of just the water is not going to you know, pull it all the way up. Now, of course, the water coming out of the tap is pressurized, but uh, you know, if you're dealing with very tall buildings, you know, if you're you know, those uh, skyscrapers that go up you know, nearly 1,000 feet into the air, um, you can't just you know, put up you know, one pump on the bottom and push everything up. Basically, it has to go up part way up the building, and then they need to repressurize it, pump it up the rest of the way, and then repressurize it because otherwise the folks on the bottom are going to have super pressurized water that's going to come shooting out of their taps like crazy. So you need some way of uh, regulating the water pressure you know, in those very large buildings there. Actually, using this little pressure equation, we can uh, examine something which I'm sure all of you are familiar with if you've ever gone up and down uh, the uh, hill on Stadium between um, Ellis and Stoltzman. All right, so you know that's that gigantic hill just right off campus. And, and the height difference on that hill um, works out to be 61 meters. All right, and I just uh, went to Google Earth and looked at you know the altitude between you know Ellis and uh, Stoltzman, and it works out to be 61 uh, meters there. Okay, so essentially what we're looking at here is so here's just a little uh, map, very bad drawing here, but uh, this here of course is Stadium, and then uh, up here this is of course going to be Ellis, and then down here this is uh, Stoltzman. All right, and the height difference between these parts is going to be equal to 60, 61 meters. Okay, so that's the altitude difference between um, Ellis and Stoltzman, approximately at least going off of what uh, Google Maps uh, actually says. Um, now we're gonna figure out is, well, what is the pressure difference between the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill? Now with air, like I said, you usually can't use this pressure equation that we've been seeing because the density varies a lot with altitude. But if we're dealing with a very small um, altitude difference, the density is constant enough that you know, we can get away with it. So what's the density of air, of course? Uh, we could actually calculate that using the ideal gas law, but for right now we'll just cheat and just look up a value here. So the density of air is uh, one point. So the density of air right here is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. So um, we're just going to find out, well, what is my change in my pressure between um, Stoltzman and Ellis up here? So the change in the pressure, of course, is just going to be um, my density of air times my height that I have there times, of course, gravity. So that's going to be 1.225. And that means my pressure is going to be 730 pascals different. All right, and PA, that's just pascals. Now, of course, we're not used to thinking in terms of pascals. So um, what is this in terms of um, our little barometer?
that we were actually just looking at here, you know, in terms of the millimeters of mercury. Well, we have a conversion here um, that one atmosphere is equal to 101.325 pascals, which is equivalent, as we saw up here, to 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so these are both um, equivalent, so we can actually just figure out um, how many millimeters of mercury our barometer would actually change by. And once we do that, uh, we wind up with so once we do that, we end up with 5.5 uh, millimeters of mercury difference uh, between um, you know, the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill. And actually, if you had a mercury barometer, and uh, for some reason we were willing to actually haul this up and down the hill, you would actually see you know, the uh, mercury change in height by about a half a centimeter. So that's you know, something which is easily measurable. Um, you know, if everything is uh, well controlled. And actually, if you've gone up and down this hill um, in your car fairly fast, I'm sure you've all felt your ears pop. And the reason for that is, of course, the air pressure change. And, you know, this is the amount of air pressure that um, you're, you're feeling, and actually, and really the amount of air pressure changes, uh, you know, that causes your ears to pop is actually less than this because you usually feel it, you know, about halfway up and down the hill. So that's probably um, only about uh, 200 or 300 pascals is what uh, we can feel when we're having our ears pop. That's um, the, the basic stuff uh, with uh, barometers and stuff. Now, one other thing to mention about pressure is that uh, the pressure is always going to be perpendicular to the surface, all right? So what does this mean is that, you know, if I have here, for instance, you know, this battery, um, which direction is the pressure pushing on this battery? You know, I'm just talking about the air pressure, not my fingers on this. Well, in this case, the pressure is pushing this way, and it's pushing this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. So it's pushing perpendicular to every single surface. All right, and on my hands, you know, my wrinkly hands, you know, it's pushing perpendicular to every little part of me. Um, it's not like the pressure is a little bit higher on the top than on the bottom. The pressure is equivalent, you know, on both sides, ignoring the small little height differences there. Um, but, you know, the pressure is just pushing perpendicular to the surface. So, for instance, just think about, you know, if you're actually in a pool, well, you know, the water that's pushing, you know, down on you over here is also, you know, pushing up on the underside of you here, you know, so the pressure is equivalent um, on every surface of you. Um, and it's only when you have some like pressure differences do you start feeling things. And that's, of course, if you have something like a suction or some wind uh, which is actually blowing there, which would be uh, actual pressure differences. Now, one other little thing we want to do is here, we want to use this barometer again to figure out well, what is the mass of our atmosphere. Okay. Remember we said here that the weight of the mercury is the weight of the atmosphere? Well, that's just the weight of the mercury for this particular cross section. Okay, so what we're going to see here is that, you know, the uh, weight of my mercury, which is going to be over a certain cross-sectional area like this, is supported by an equivalent cross-sectional area of the atmosphere on this side. Now, if I were to go to a bigger column like this, well, that would mean that I now have a bigger uh, cross-sectional area of atmosphere that's actually pushing it to keep it equivalent. So if you want to take this to the extreme, the entire weight of the atmosphere um, would be, you know, the Earth surrounded by a sphere, which is 760 millimeters of thick um, of mercury. So that's what we're going to do is figure out, well, what is the volume of that little mercury sphere? So what I have here is the Earth. I'm obviously not drawn to scale. Uh, <clears throat> so the Earth here has a radius R, and the radius of my Earth here is uh, 6370 kilometers. And then what I'm doing is I'm putting a small little um, sphere of mercury surrounding the Earth. So the little Earth, or the little, uh, the little mercury here, has a thickness of uh, 76 or 760 millimeters. Because that's going to be, of course, my mercury height from the barometer. So essentially we're just taking this mercury, 760 millimeters of it, and surrounding the entire Earth with that. Uh, what we just want to do is, of course, uh, put all these things into uh, centimeters, and you'll see why in a minute. So again, just to uh, convert this stuff. Um, but anyway, what we basically have here is uh, the radius of the Earth in terms of centimeters is 6.370 times 10 to the 8 centimeters, and of course our thickness of mercury, that just goes to 76 uh, centimeters there. So as you can see, the obviously there's a large difference between these two values. I mean, this is much, much smaller. Uh, than the other one. So what we're going to do here is find out what is the volume of my Earth plus Mercury and then subtract off the volume of my um, Earth to get the volume of my Mercury. So the volume of any sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we're just going to calculate this. So this is going to be 4 thirds pi. And now this is going to be r, big R plus little r because that's the Earth plus the, um, the Mercury cubed. So that's what we would actually calculate. And we could theoretically just 
plug in these numbers um, into the calculator and we could get an answer. Um, but here I just want to show you a little technique that um, can come in very handy. Um, you know, if you happen not to have your calculator with you or, you know, if you have even bigger numbers and the calculator can't actually handle them. So if we actually just want to, um, you know, foil this one out, uh, you know, just uh, show out, you know, what this is. So this way we can actually subtract off the uh, large R um, in this case. So what we're going to have here is, of course, all right, so I just factored out my 4 thirds pi just to make it simple. And now I'm just going to, uh, you know, uh, multiply this out. And that's, you can just use Pascal's triangle. Uh, to actually figure that out there. So that's, you know, this right here, that's my r plus little r cubed, is this entire thing minus the big r cubed. Now obviously we can see what subtracts out. My big r cubes um, cancel each other out, so that's very nice. These just go away. And now I'm left here with three big r squared little r plus three big r little r squared plus little r cubed. What you can look at is if, since we know what these values are, and we know that big r is much, much bigger than little r, that means that this right here is going to be huge, but right here, these are going to be relatively small compared to that. Just look at this value here. This is 10 to the 8th. That's about 10 to the 2 approximately, right? So that means that if I have here 10 to the 8th squared, that's 10 to the 16th times another hundredth, so that's 10 to the 18th-ish, right? So that's 10 to the 18th right here. On the other hand, for this one, that's just going to be 10 to the 8th times a thousand or so or ten thousand so that's going to be like ten to the tenth or ten to the twelfth somewhere in that vicinity um, this is much smaller than this ten to the eighteenth or so right so since this is so much smaller we can safely ignore it same thing for this one we're dealing with again you know ten to the eighteenth or whatever versus you know a couple of thousand all right so this is going to be very very small so these things right here they're going to be approximately zero in other words they're just small we can ignore so that means that our volume here of my mercury is going to be approximately 4 thirds pi times 3 big R squared little r. And of course, then my 3's cancel out. So I'm going to get here 4 pi big R squared little r. Now you might recognize this part right here as the surface area of a sphere. And this little r right here is essentially the height, right? We had the surface area of the sphere, and all we did was we just multiplied that by the height. So essentially that's what we did. We just kind of took the surface area of the sphere and multiplied by the height. But again, to kind of just show you explicitly, you know, rather than just saying, well, here's the surface area of the Earth, multiply by how thick it is, um, we just, you know, explicitly showed that, you know, that's a, a pretty good first approximation uh, to that. So we have here our numbers, and then we're just going to take these numbers here and plug them in um, to our equation. And we get because that's centimeters squared times centimeters, that's going to be centimeters cubed. And that's, of course, why at the very beginning I just converted these to centimeters so you wouldn't have to worry about some weird conversion units. Um, now, that's the volume of mercury. Uh, earlier we saw over here the density of mercury was 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So now we have our volume, we have our density. We can easily just multiply those two together to get the mass of my mercury. And this gives us... Yeah, and then you can just easily convert this into kilograms if we want to. So what we've done here is calculate out what the mass of this mercury is. And if you remember from what we said here, the weight of the mercury is equal to the weight of the atmosphere. So after all this calculation right here, this is our weight of our atmosphere, or the mass of the atmosphere as well. So actually, after all the calculating, that's what we figured out, is we've actually weighed the atmosphere. Now, we could have theoretically done that, you know, using this kind of equation, but like I said, the density depends upon distance, so we can't really do that, you know, without using calculus, and we obviously want to avoid that. So um, we did this nice little turnaround right here by basically using the, uh, the mass of the mercury and thinking about, you know, how the barometer actually relates um, to the weight of the atmosphere and actually figuring out, well, if the Earth was actually surrounded by mercury, that would be an equivalent weight um, of the atmosphere there. Okay, so we've already seen a couple of conversions, and I just want to write down all the conversions, you know, just in one place so we can uh, kind of see them all at once here. So these are all equal, equivalent, okay, so these are all equivalent to one atmosphere of pressure. So these are all the conversions. Now, the good thing for you is that um, do not you know, I mean, if you want to memorize them, great, but I'm not going to make you memorize them, and, you know, all these conversion factors will always be provided for you on, you know, exams and everything. So um, you can write them in your notebooks and stuff to reference them while you're doing your homeworks and stuff, but I will always give it to you because folks will come up with weird numbers um, when you're dealing with these. 
All right, now these are equivalent. They're all they're used a bunch of places, and there's probably some other pressure units that I'm uh, forgetting. But at least in chemistry in the real world, this is the the ones that we encounter um, the most. All right, so we've seen Pascals, and uh, right here, this is the SI um, unit, as we saw you know, when we did the derivation where this came from. So this is uh, the uh, SI base unit here, and um, equivalently, a lot of times in Europe, they uh, you know, might just use the kilopascal um, because you know, 101, 325, that's kind of a large unit. So instead, in, in Europe, they might just report their pressures about 101 kilopascals um, if you look on the, the European weather there. Um, now, bars, uh, those are, especially right here, the millibars, these are commonly used in uh, meteorology. So if you ever uh, watch or about the weather and look at some weather maps, you know, you might see, you know, that they're talking about, you know, certain layers of the atmosphere, you know, 850 millibars, 200 millibars, and so on. Um, so that's what they talk about. A lot of times when they're talking about the hurricanes, they're talking about the pressure in terms of millibars. Um, that's actually uh, fairly common um, with that. It's equivalent to a hectopascal um, as well. Um, this one right here, this of course is in the U.S. if you watch the weather reports. So they always talk about, you know, the pressure is rising, pressure is falling, and they always give the pressure values in terms of inches of mercury. Um, and again, the inches of mercury to millimeters of mercury, um, these are equivalent. You know, it's the same, exact same thing that we saw over here, except, you know, the height instead of being 760 millimeters works out to be 29.92 inches. Um, and you can just go verify that uh, by yourself that they're um, the same heights, basically. Because we're in the U.S., we like to use uh, the English units there. Um, and then, of course, we have the millimeters of mercury. These are commonly used in chemistry uh, very often, although, again, it depends on um, exactly what you're doing. But, you know, these are very common in chemistry. And the nice thing is when you're dealing with these uh, millimeters of mercury or TOR, again, TOR is named after uh, Torricelli, um, is that, you know, if you just have your barometer, you can literally just go read it right off of the barometer, which is in the lab. Although nowadays, um, it's actually becoming extremely hard to find mercury barometers actually, you know, in the labs because mercury, you know, being a hazardous substance and people tend to break things, uh, they try to uh, get rid of these as much as possible. So nowadays you usually just kind of get like electronic barometers um, unless you need very precise work um, for that. All right, and then of course uh, down here again, um, you know, pounds per square inch or PSI. I'm sure all of you, um, you know, pumped up your tires at some point or another and you've probably seen over here, if I can zoom in a little bit. So over here, of course, if you have your gauges, um, for instance, this is for a, my bike pump. Um, but right here, you can see, you know, here's the PSI. They also report it in bars, um, and you can easily convert that um, into kilopascals if you want to. Uh, they're a little bit off from, um, you know, the values we have over here. But again, they're just basically rounding because um, you don't need that precision, you know, if you're pumping up your bike tires. And uh, normally, you know, of course, depending on the bike you have and the type of tires you have, you know, you need more or less pressure. Um, you know, so if you're doing like all-terrain stuff, you want lower pressure because you're going to be bouncing up and down all the time, so you don't want to cause your tires to explode. Um, hybrid bike, like I have, um, actually, uh, you, I usually go around 80 PSI for mine, and that's usually pretty good. If you have a road bike, um, that's where you have those very narrow tires, and you're basically just trying to minimize the amount of surface area that you're actually touching the road, so you get, you know, better um, or less, less friction uh, and, uh, you know, less uh, tire flexing. And, of course, if you're doing track stuff, um, you know, like racing bikes on a track or something, you want really high pressures um, for this. Although this little uh, bike pump, you would like totally kill yourself just trying to pump that up uh, to that high pressure there. So these, are, and um, yeah, so these are, you know, again, the ones that you see, you know, like if you inflate your tires or your balls, um, occasionally you'll see those uh, things as well. All right, and then how we uh, use these conversions is actually very simple. So if uh, you remember back in uh, 2005, which was uh, 10 years ago, actually, uh, when we had Hurricane Wilma, so that was uh, the hurricane, um, that was the same year as Katrina and everything, but that one came up over Florida and then went up uh, the uh, east coast of the United States there. And actually it had the record low, you know, as of uh, filming of this, uh, of uh, record low pressure in the uh, Atlantic uh, basin there. Of uh, This was in 20, 2005, of course. Uh, so this was record low. 882 millibar of pressure. So that was its record low pressure. And basically we just want to see, well, what is this in, you know, other uh, pressure units here. So if we want to do that, we just go, you know, and just do our normal conversion factors, right? So since this is millibar, we just want to convert this into bar. So we, um, you know, say it's the same milli SI prefix from before. There's nothing weird about that. And then, uh, then we can just look up here. There's 1.01325 bars, and let's say we just want to uh, go into um, inches of mercury for this. 
And again, you know, millibars cancel, bars cancel, we're left with uh, inches of mercury. And this works out to be 26.0 inches of mercury. Right? So actually, if you had your barometer in there, um, that would decrease by nearly four inches. So, you know, that's a pretty good decrease to see in the mercury there. Um, all right, and then we can also look at, well, what's that equivalent in atmospheres um, of this? So again, you know, we just start off the exact same thing. I'm just not going to write it again. And then we just use this conversion up here, one atmosphere is uh, to uh, 1.01325 bar. And that works out to be, so um, instead of one atmosphere, the pressure inside of there was 0 0.870 um, atmospheres for that. Anyway, I will end this here and uh, probably continue on with this tomorrow.